1989, the most magical time of the year. Five-year-old Melissa Brannon goes missing after attending a Christmas party with her mother. Police officers, soldiers, and volunteers desperately search for the young girl for several days without success. When the searching stops, authorities approach the case from a different angle. They are certain the five-year-old has been abducted and a suspect enters their crosshairs. That man is brought to trial and convicted, closing one door, but many remain open. After the disappearance, Fairfax County would experience a string of attempted deductions, and the media would ignite a firestorm. The disappearance of Melissa Brannon is one of the most frustrating and heartbreaking Christmas tales. This video will chronicle the disappearance, the aftermath, and the alleged killer's escape from justice. In 1985, five-year-old Melissa Brannon was living at the Woodside Apartments in Lorton, Virginia with her single mother, Tammy. She was a happy child who loved music and singing along. She was very smart, knowing how to use the telephone and having memorized her phone number. On Sunday, December the 3rd, Melissa and her mother attended a Christmas party at the apartment complex's clubhouse with roughly a hundred other residents. The young girl wore a blue turtleneck with Big Bird on it, red plaid skirt, and a pink parka. While Melissa spent most of the night on her mother's lap, at one point, she dashed around the room with two boys and pretended to use a nearby telephone to call her mother. The party would end for Melissa and Tammy around 10 p.m. As the couple prepared to leave, Melissa put on her coat before going back for more potato chips. When her daughter didn't return, Tammy began to panic. She anxiously searched the property in hopes of finding her daughter. She entered a utility room off the lobby marked private and found the window wide open before letting out a harrowing scream. Woods covered the landscape outside the window, making it a perfect escape route for a predator. Fairfax police responded quickly and a massive search was conducted in hopes of finding the missing girl. More than 400 volunteers combed the woods in the cold rain on the third and final day of searches. The three foot, 48 pound kindergartner was nowhere to be found. While the search for Melissa Brandon had stalled, police wasted no time identifying a suspect. 23 year old Caleb D. Hughes worked as a groundskeeper at the Woodside Apartments and his actions would put him at the center of the investigation. Caleb went to Potomac High School, where he was described as a shy, withdrawn loner. Caleb was not the type of person to stand out. If you had met him, you probably would not remember him. His parents split when he was 10, and he lived a chaotic childhood with constant conflict. His brother Scott and Scott's wife Shannon were found shot to death in March of 1988. Caleb would experience his own turmoil and soon find himself in the middle of a massive police investigation. During the 1989 Christmas party at Woodside Apartments, Caleb sat with Tammy and Melissa. He said Melissa was pretty 
and he retrieved her a cupcake. After police arrived at the scene, they tried tracking down Caleb Hughes. A call to his wife revealed that he was not at home. While Hughes lived less than 10 miles from Woodside, he did not return home until 12.30 a.m., approximately two and a half hours after Melissa went missing. Caleb raised suspicion by not immediately returning calls from authorities. Instead, he took a shower and threw his shoes and clothes into a washing machine. Around 1 a.m., he finally called the apartment complex and agreed to meet with police. While police zoned in on Caleb Hughes, the community did its best to help bring Melissa home. Her grandparents, Art and Rosalie, launched a yellow ribbon campaign, asking others to tie yellow ribbons around trees until the girls returned. Two anonymous individuals offered a $75,000 reward for Melissa, pushing the total up to 85000 Movie theaters in Fairfax and Prince William counties featured a part of a home movie of Melissa. Bumper stickers saying bring Melissa Brandon home for Christmas were distributed throughout the county. Video stores flashed Melissa's face on their screens and posters were put up in several buildings in downtown Washington. Melissa's face and name were everywhere, but she was nowhere to be found. During the months following Melissa's disappearance, there would be many close calls in Fairfax County. January the 9th, 1990, a 10-year-old girl was grabbed by a man near Barrett Elementary School and taken to a nearby apartment complex. January the 17th, Fairfax County Police reported that an 11-year-old girl had been grabbed by a man claiming to be a police officer near Bailey's Elementary School roughly a month before Melissa's disappearance. That girl broke free and escaped before the man fled on foot. It was believed that both men were Hispanic. An 11-year-old school crossing guard was grabbed by a man at the corner of North Kings Highway and Fort Drive. The boy managed to escape. The suspect was described as being a white male in his 30s. A man believed to be Hispanic chased a 12-year-old Annandale boy after trying to force him into his white car. The incident took place around 8 a.m. as the boy walked to the bus stop. Fairfax County was bursting at the seams with child predators just waiting to get their hands on an innocent young victim. The individual responsible for Melissa's disappearance could have been anyone, but police believed they had the right man. Once the name Caleb Hughes was leaked to the media, the case would transform into a media circus. The 23-year-old had served time in prison from 1985 through December 1986 for unauthorized use of a vehicle and grand larceny. In 1987, he was convicted of contributing to the delinquency of a minor. He was given a suspended sentence for giving beer to a 15-year-old and harboring a youth he knew had run away from home. News crews parked outside his Woodbridge home, and every encounter with authorities was documented. A federal grand jury ordered Caleb Hughes to submit to blood and other forensic tests. He was also served with a federal subpoena, forcing him to appear before the grand jury. In mid-January of 1990, police would make their move. A judge revoked Caleb's probation on motor vehicle charges, sending him back to prison for four years. In February, the case would take a startling turn. 
Tammy received a frightening phone call from a man threatening to harm Melissa unless she paid a $75,000 ransom. Tammy received two phone calls before agreeing to pay the ransom. She took a package to a man in front of a Washington hotel and police followed the suspect back to a dorm at Howard University. While the man was identified as a courier for a commercial delivery service, the sting would lead to the arrest of two men responsible for the extortion attempt. Former Howard University student Emmett Greer was sentenced to 46 months and his accomplice, 24-year-old Anthony McCray, was sentenced to 92 months in prison. In June of 1990, it would only be months before Caleb Hughes would be eligible for parole. Authorities knew that they needed to act quickly to prevent the alleged child abductor from walking free. Fairfax County prosecutors announced that they would seek an indictment against the maintenance worker in Melissa's disappearance. Caleb would be formally indicted in November of 1990, but he would not be charged with murder. Since there was no body and no evidence that Melissa was murdered, Caleb would only face one count of abduction with intent to defile. Before the trial, Caleb would be appointed an attorney by the name of Peter Greenspun. He would become a constant thorn in the sight of prosecutors, who he said were trying to prevent him from representing his client effectively. During numerous court hearings leading up to the trial, the evidence investigators collected against Caleb would be revealed for the first time. Fur had been found in Caleb's vehicle, and authorities contended that the fur resembled that of Tammy's coat. Blue and red cotton fibers were found in the vehicle as well. Prosecutors believed that those fibers came from the clothing Melissa was wearing at the time of her disappearance. A strand of hair was also found in the car. The Commonwealth's attorney, Robert Horan, said it was consistent with Melissa's hair. Sheriff Carl Peed told the Washington Times, Because of the media involvement and the emotionally charged nature of the case, there will be additional security. Extra deputies and metal detectors were used to keep Caleb Hughes safe during the trial. The trial of Caleb Hughes started on February the 25th of 1991. Robert Horan immediately set out to prove Hughes guilt using a combination of hair, fiber, and other evidence. Tammy Brandon would be the first witness to take the stand. She told the jury that Caleb had told Melissa she was pretty, but that was fairly common. When Tammy took Melissa and two boys to the bathroom, Caleb, who was coming out of the men's bathroom, offered to take the children to the bathroom for her. She thought that this was unusual. The lead investigator, William Wilden, took the stand and said Hughes told him he couldn't remember where he had been in the hours following the disappearance, but he remembered taking the long road home. Sixty navy blue acrylic and red cotton fibers were found on the front seat of the Honda Civic the defendant was driving that night. Witnesses claimed that those fibers were the same one used to make the Big Bird sweater and red plaid skirt Melissa had been wearing. Robert Horan rested the state's case after an FBI agent said blood discovered in Caleb's car belonged to Caleb Hughes or Melissa Brannon. That FBI agent, Robert Crispiano, found blood on one of Caleb's shoes and on tissues in a box in his vehicle. The tissues in the car were found two weeks after the girl disappeared and one week after it had been searched thoroughly by police. Crispiano said that the blood on the tissues in the compartment may have belonged to Hughes. The blood in a tissue box 
It might have been Melissa's, but it was not Caleb's. Defense attorney Peter Greenspun would begin his case by trying to show that the blood type matched 40% of the population, so it could have belonged to almost anyone. Then he would call an expert in DNA identification, Dwight Adams, to refute Robert Grispiano's claims. Adams had used DNA genetic testing to analyze the blood and claimed the blood on the facial tissue was from the defendant, Caleb Hughes. Professor at the University of Maryland, Department of Textile and Consumer Economics, Ira Block contested the state's fabric evidence. Ira would say that the blue acrylic fibers belonged to a tracksuit belonging to the Hughes family. As for the red cotton fibers, there was nothing unique about them, so they could have came from anywhere. Caleb's wife, Carol, would take the stand and dispute claims made by police. Police claimed that Caleb did not return home until 1 o'clock, but Carol said her husband was back around 1.30 on the night of Melissa's disappearance. During cross-examination, Carol would be reminded of the three times authorities called her, asking if Caleb was home. She had also placed two calls to a bar her husband frequented, asking of his whereabouts. Carol was adamant that Caleb definitely would not have abducted five-year-old Melissa Brannon. On March the 8th of 1991, it was time for the jury to have its say. It would not take long for Caleb Hughes to learn his fate. On the 9th, the jury returned with a guilty verdict and a recommendation of 50 years for Caleb Hughes. Sentencing was immediately scheduled for April the 12th. After the trial, it was reported that Fairfax County Commonwealth's attorney, Robert Horan, had offered Hughes a deal if he would show them where Melissa's body was. Caleb's attorney, Peter Greenspun, call the ideal outrageous since his client denied any involvement. On May the 8th of 1991, Circuit Judge Joanna Fitzpatrick accepted the jury's recommendation and sentenced Caleb Hughes to 50 years in prison. However, he would be eligible for parole in just 12. Greenspun would fight for a new trial for his client he would find two witnesses willing to testify for Caleb. James Kiefer was willing to testify that Hughes was not at the party 30 minutes before the girl disappeared. The Nell Sheriff's deputy lived in the apartment complex and attended the party. The judge refused to hear from the second witness, a Washington lawyer who thought he saw Melissa on a subway train with a man and woman after she went missing. 53-year-old Department of Veterans Affairs lawyer Hilton Cobb called police on December the 5th to tell them he saw a couple hiding the missing girl in a large coat on a subway in downtown Washington. In the end, Caleb Hughes would not receive a new trial and the Hughes family would be rocked once again in October of 1991 when Caleb Hughes' cousin, George Hughes, was killed by a car bomb. George was said to testify against another man who had threatened to burn down a Prince William County restaurant. That man, Richard Capote, was a member of the Fates Assembly motorcycle gang and was fatally shot by a rival gang member in June of 1993, Caleb Hughes received good news. A three-judge panel for the Virginia Court of Appeals ruled that there was not sufficient evidence to prove Caleb Hughes intended to defile his victim. But that victory would be short-lived. After backlash from the public and media, the court would reverse its earlier decision. Just a year later, the Virginia Court of Appeals ruled 5-4 to four 
to reinstate Caleb's conviction. Caleb Hughes would sit in prison until August the 2nd of 2019. After serving 29 years and 7 months, or roughly 54% of his sentence, Caleb would be released. Despite a few scares over the years, Melissa Brandon has never been found. Melissa Brandon was born on April the 12th of 1984. She has been missing for 30 years. Today, she would be 35 years old. <laughs>